Uh, yes, I do have a lot to say today. And that wasn't a part of what I was going to say. But we're going to get through it, and we will get you out on time. We will get you out on time. <laughs> Don't hold me to that. Um, I, I, I am excited about um, really this series, this series and what we've been doing, Be Reconciled, this idea, this is what we've talked about, the, um, just reconciliation. Right? God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And Paul goes on to even take it a step further. And he says that it is, he is an ambassador of Christ. And his whole identity is, this, is the concept of being reconciled. That a lot of times as believers, because of our flesh, we want to give a plan B. We want to give alternatives. We want to give other options. We want to make it about everything else. We want to give reasons and excuses of why we can't be reconciled. But God says, listen, though it is about reconciliation. There is no plan B. There is no anything else. This is about a reconciled relationship with God in which we have constant communion with the Father and with one another. And if we recognize and we come to the realization that what sin did, it, was, it created separation. That when sin entered into the world, it created separation between God and man and man and woman and man and man. That they understood and sin brought about division. And whenever we are living in isolation and are living in the midst of division, we are not living according to the ways of the Lord. We are either living out a manifestation of the ways of this world or a result of the fall. Today, really what I want to talk to you is, is, is this idea, it's not really even about reconciliation per se, and this is what I love about the scriptures is that when, especially when you're teaching expositionally or verse by verse, is that like there's sometimes these, these twists in the, in the scripture that you're just like, okay, now I, I don't really get the flow. I really don't get the, the understanding because today we're actually going to be talking about gener being a generous steward. And we're going to talk about this idea of relationship of money and, and of our time, talent, and treasure. And we've been arguing throughout this whole time that this, is, this book is about reconciliation, but all of a sudden it's kind of, we take this sharp left in the book of 2 Corinthians in chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, let's open up there to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we're going to look at the first 15 verses today. We're going to hone in on the first 15 verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And going to look at what Paul kind of identifies this idea or these two models or examples of people who are generous. And hopefully tie that into why that is important when we talk about this concept of being reconciled. These models and these examples. And, you know, over this past month, I've been traveling a lot. I have been gone. I am so grateful that it, that time is done and it is over, that over the course of these next two months, I travel like one time for like a day, and I'm just like praising the Lord for that. But, but while, while I was overseas, or while I was specifically this past week, I celebrated a birthday, and Angie and I got a chance to go to Brazil, and we got a chance to connect with the, um, the Brazilian Missionary Board in, in Brazil. And it was a tremendous time. It was a great time of just refreshment, replenishment, a great time of just learning. But one of the things that stood out more than any other thing um, over this time in Brazil was the how hospitable the Brazilians were. And the models and the examples that were constantly put in our face. Just to mention a few of them that I remember getting when we got to Brazil and um, we got in and we were lost and we, they didn't speak what we were trying to speak, the language, and we was, you know, we, we were just kind of lost there. And so we ended up getting a taxi cab driver, a taxi. And so the, the place that we were going was over two hours away. And so as we were riding in the taxi, the, with this taxi, it was just interesting because um, first he did something that no other taxi person ever did. He, he says, hey, you know, you need the internet. Here's my hotspot. You know, he just kind of offered kind of his hotspot to me. And then he was just like, man, do you want something to eat? And I was like, man, this, usually taxi people don't ask, you know, for something to eat. But he was just asking me something. He was like, no, nah, I'm good. Let's just keep going. Let's get to the place. It was kind of weird to me. But he was like, so we just kept on going. But then 
Like, he was like, he asked again. He's like, man, you sure you don't want something to eat? I was like, yeah, okay, sure. We'll grab something because it is, you know, we haven't eaten and it has been a while. And so we pull off to the side and we go to this kind of restaurant. And, and in the midst of this, he comes in with us and he goes and like, as we started like this, telling us what the foods are, we get the food, we walk up to the counter and then he says, you're in my country, I pay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, this brother's using his money to pay, and he's offered us. And then I was just like, man, there's something not right. I was like, oh, man, he must be expecting some type of big tip, you know, because, you know, he's American. So there has to be some angle, some direction that he's coming for him. You know, and so, but then we get dropped off and we go to the place. And so the whole time now I'm stressed out because we don't have any Brazilian cash. We have this American. I was like, this brother's going to think I can pay him back and we don't have it. But then when we went, he gave us the receipt, put it on the credit card. There's no place for tips. When I talked to the people, I was like, hey, you know, I need to tip them. He was like, no, 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 no. You know, in the Brazilian, I guess in the Brazilian culture, what he told me was that there's, it's not a culture for tipping. And I was just blown away at the time, again, with this driver and all that we were trying to do, that, that we did that. And then again, so that was one. Then we went to the restaurants. And over and over again, you see the wait staff, and it was just coming. But then again, just from there, it went, it finally kind of went to the next, when the head guy over there, a guy named um, Pastor Fernando and his wife, uh, Marcia, when they found out that we were there, they reorganized their calendars. They, they met, gave us time to meet with all their staff. They bought our kids gifts. He was like, how many kids do you have? Six. And it was like they bought every one of our kids gifts. They, I mean, it was just kind of like, where am I? <laughs> right? And I, was, I mean, seriously, where are I? And then even it's like, we're going to take care of everything. And then this guy, another guy, um, Luciano, came and he says, man, let me, let me take you to the airport. He took us to the airport. He didn't just drop us off at the curb. He took us all the way to the, to the end. I mean, it was just over and over and over again that I saw models and models and models of examples of hospitality. My wife, we were just blown away by the hospitality that was shown over there, and it really impacted our life. And, I, and as I was thinking about kind of the hospitality that was there, what really sealed this idea of hospitality and how, why I became, I felt like they were so hospitable is because they weren't just creating space or just being nice and pleasant with conversations. But what sealed their generosity was that they were willing to give and to sacrifice all of their time, all of their talent, and all of their treasure. And there was something about when you're, that when you are able to give all your resources and you're generous, that, that it takes it to another thing of just saying something and actually being something. And I truly believe that the acts of grace that we experience over and over and over again in Brazil has both changed and will change how Angela and I will seek to be hospitable. It has redefined it in a way that I never would have imagined. You see, Paul is about to make a quick shift. We've been talking about being reconciled. We talked about last week having tough conversations. We talked about before that this idea of divine grace and, 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 and enablement. We've, we've talked about this idea of be reconciled, be reconciled. But in all of a sudden, we come in and then Paul goes in for two chapters. And basically, there's a shift in the subject matter. and He's talking about this idea of being a generous steward. You see, when we talk about this idea, it's like we love this idea of being reconciled. We love this idea of giving and being generous. Um, when it, one, when it happens to us, we love you to be generous towards me. But the other thing is that we love being generous in kind of theory, right? Because really, we don't really like talking about kind of money. Like, pastor, we can talk about everything, but don't talk about money and don't try to get me on mission. Right? I, be, I do everything else. Right? But when we talk about here, when we say it's one of our aims, a generous stewards, and we say as generous stewards, we faithfully manage our time, our talent, and our treasure as resources for God's purposes. As resources for God's purposes. 
And so through this text, what Paul is doing is that he's revisiting a subject matter that he addressed early on, right? So if we, look at, if we look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul starts this off this way. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that was given to the churches of Macedonia. Oftentimes when you see, and if you track through kind of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, Paul basically where it says, we want you to know, he's saying that there's a slight change in the subject matter that we had. That if you looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, around verse 14, all the way through chapter 7, Paul was talking about this tension that they had between him and the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians. And Paul basically, if we if you remember, in the very first Chap, I mean, the very first week that we talked about reconciliation, we talked about why 2 Corinthians is really a response to the reaction of what took place in 1 Corinthians. That 1 Corinthians was so hard on the Corinthians that many Bible commentators have basically called 1 Corinthians spanking the saints. That it was just this hardship that was going on that Paul had to address the divisions and how many divisions that they had in the church. And that these divisions were, were caused because of the, the tension that they had. And even the tension that they had that, would be, that you would consider um, kind of ambitions. The tension that if you just did a survey of 1 Corinthians, you would see the tension of religious behavior. You would see denominationalism. People talk about some say you're of Paul and some say you're of Apollos and some say, and then like all these different divisions. He says the, the, the difference between the, the Jew and the Gentile. You see these, um, the differences about sexual behavior. You saw the differences about religious practices and how one is to conduct themselves in the church. You see divisions that even ordinances and taking the Lord's table and how that has brought divisions in the church. Right? This is the book that they address tongues, to speak or to not to speak in tongues. Spiritual gifts. They talked about women's roles in the church. The same things that divide our churches up very often, Paul beeline to these issues and he addresses them. But Paul, then he gives this gospel treaty in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, talking about what the gospel is. And then it's after he presents the gospel in 1 Corinthians in the power of the resurrection, he ends the book in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, talking about this idea of stewardship, and specifically stewardship to the Lord's work. I don't think it's by osmo or by chance that that happens. And see, and I, and I really believe that Paul, as he is about to bring up examples or models of, gener of being a generous steward, that he is tying these, these two things together. He says, you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the last letter? Let's revisit that. Let's revisit what took place. And he says, in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul gave us what I consider the building blocks of what it means to be a generous steward. He gave us the building blocks, right? And, and I really want to briefly go, because if you don't really get 1 Corinthians 16, you're not going to understand 2 Corinthians 8, chapter 8, and chapter 9. It's going to seem random to where Paul is going. But it's, you, there's a background and there's history, and you'll see a lot of overlap of what's taking place. And so Paul basically wants them to understand that Generous, being a generous steward is motivated by grace. It's motivated by grace. And, and he comes through these building blocks. The building blocks of giving are the building blocks of giving for a generous steward. And here's quickly, just to kind of give you um, the background in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 through 4, these building blocks. And I'm not going to read it. You can read it later. Building block number one is the priority of giving. When he talks about this idea of being a generous steward, he says there's a priority that we have in giving. The priority of giving. He says here in, this, in the passage, he talks about this idea of giving of first priority. Angie, let me see your, your Bible real quick. Because I do want, I'm going to read it real quick and that's not here. 
I'm going to read the, the verses in 1 Corinthians 16. And then I will then we'll break it down. Verse, 16 verses 1 through 4 says this. Now, about the collection for the saints, do the same as I instructed the Galatian churches. On the first day of the week, each of you is to set something aside and save in keeping with how he is prospering so that no collections will need to be made when I come. When I arrive, I will send the, with letters those who recommend to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it is suitable for me to go as well, they will travel with me. What I want you to do later, we won't have the time now, is to go back and reread 1 Corinthians chapter 16, really chapter 16, the first 15 verses, and then come back and read 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You will see enormous similarities. We don't have the time to build, it, to build the case now, but enormous similarities of what Paul is intentionally doing because some of the words are almost verbatim. So he's tying them back to this experience. And as Paul is tying these experiences, he is basically giving them these building blocks and he's returning to these building blocks. That first building blocks, as I was talking about, is the, is the idea of the priority of giving. The priority of giving. He said, when he talks about it, and this is a priority, he says that he gives to all the churches. Because in 16, he says, do the same as I instructed to all the Galatian churches. The second, Corinthians was written during Paul's second missionary journey. That when we recognize that Paul's first missionary journey was focused on the churches in Galatia. So Paul is talking about the churches that, that he has, that he was a part of planting, starting, and being around. So this was a normal recurrence of how he addressed this idea or the motivation of being stewardship. So he talks about the priority of giving, right? The second thing that we see that it says that um, the second building block is this idea of the consistency of giving. Again, in verse 2 of chapter 16, it says, on the first day of the week. And that word, when it talks about of the week, he's talking about some translations, talks about every week. On the first day of every week, right? And so the first thing that he's saying is that at the very beginning, on the outset, you've got to prioritize giving. God is looking for the first fruits. He's not looking for your leftovers. And so he says, but not only is not God not looking for your leftovers, God is looking for you to be consistently. This is not about a one-time thing. This is not about a Hail Mary. This is not about the, the, the times in your life. He says there's a consistency on the first day of every week that we have. So he talks about the consistency of giving. And, and 2 Corinthians 9 brings this principle out. He says, whoever sows sparingly will what? Also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will what? will reap bountifully. He says this is the idea of consistency that we have, and he's going to come back to that later when we look at chapter 9. So he reminds us of this. The third building block he, he talks about is the participants in giving. Who are, who's to give? Again, in 1 Corinthians 16, he says this. On the first day of the week, he says, each of you, each of you is each of you is to set something aside. So who is, the, who is supposed to be the participants? Every believer. Every believer. Right? Giving is not a tax on the wealthy. Giving is a responsibility for every believer. All right? And so he moves on and he gives us the fourth building block the appropriate amount, because then you says, well, I don't have that much to give. He goes on and he answers that again. He says, on the first day of every week, each of you is to set something aside. Well, how much? In keeping with how he is prospering. In keeping with how he is prospering. So how much are we to give? And we're going to see here, as the Lord prospers. As the Lord prospers. In, in verse 3 of chapter 8 in, of 2 Corinthians, it says, For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. Our giving should be proportionate to how much God has given you. How much God has given you. 
And so we see this taking place. So we see these first four building blocks. But then not only does he stop, does he stop there, he goes on and he says the primary place of our giving. The primary place. And he says the primary place is the local leadership, the local church. And I think this right here, building back five in chapter five of chapter 16, and again, it says, in keeping each of you is to set something aside and save it in keeping of how he is prospering so that no collections will need to be made when I come. So he's saying, you're setting this aside, not for you to think, but you're setting this aside for me as the leader, the leadership of this church. And when I arrive, I will send letters with those you recommend to carry your gift to Jerusalem if it is suitable for me to go as well with them and travel. And then he goes on to chapter 16 and he gives an explanation of that. But again, what's, what's important for us to remember is building block five talks about the primary place that Paul is calling them to give and to be generous stewards. But then in, um, in building block number six talks about the stewardship that he has as someone who's receiving it. You see, for most of you, you were very good with the first four. When number five and six came, that brought a little bit of angst in your spirit. Because it's like, okay, yeah, I know we're supposed to give. Yeah, I know we're supposed to give regularly. Yeah, I know that we're supposed to, like, I'm, God is calling me to give. And yeah, I even know that he should, I should give based upon how much I'm getting. Right? Check, check, check. I agree with all four. Five, yeah, but that giving is supposed to come to the local church. Okay, we'll hold up. Yeah, and there is a stewardship of the giving. You see, it's right there where we begin to have the angst. And this is where Paul comes back and he says, let's address the issue. The thought is, is right now Paul wrote the letter of 1 Corinthians. And as he wrote the letter of 1 Corinthians, there was some now distrust. There was some disunity. There was some brokenness. At the beginning, they were really excited about giving. Paul made it his practice throughout all the different churches to help the suffering saints that were in Jerusalem. So you see this theme going on over and over and over again. You see that in Galatians, in Ephesians. You see that Paul was oftentimes collecting for the purpose of those who are on the marginalized and was on the fringes. The Corinthian church, the thought is, is that the Corinthian church was like, yes, we're all in, let's do it. But after they started having beef, they would start as like, ah, should we still do that? No, nah, we're not doing that anymore. Can we even trust Paul with our money? I have a better solution. Why don't we just do what we, sh what we think we should do with our money and then, you know, separate ourselves? And so on one end, Paul is basically says, like, as he's going through all these ideas of reconciliation, he says, let's get us back to the thing of showing that we really are reconciled. Right? And he comes back to this very essence. And what Paul does is that he brings up two examples. And that's what we see in 2 Corinthians 8, the first 15 chapters, these two examples of what it means ultimately to be, to be reconciled and not to allow circumstances to determine or to dictate what it means to be reconciled. Right? Because in money is one of those things that don't give us this kind of maybe or almost. It's kind of like we live in this almost culture. Like, we live in this idea that the thought that counts. And as long as I think and I have desire, then that's good enough. Paul was like, no. And ultimately, multiple times he says, listen, finish what you started. Finish what you started. And he comes in and he talks about this idea of finishing, being all in, being committed to what we have. You see, because we struggle with being generous. If you just look at the surveys, according to Barnum, the idea of what Christians are giving away in terms of stewardship, I'm not talking about just to the church of this period, what Christians are giving away, according to George Barnum, who does research, he says, in the last 30 years, this has been declining dramatically. Right? He says, in fact, dollar for dollar, the average American gave more during the Great Depression than today. He says, according to Barnum, he says, between 30 to 50% of active church attenders give nothing. Among born-again adults, there was a 44% rise in those who gave nothing. Married adults are more likely than single adults to donate some money to a church in a typical month. And it talks about from 64% to 42%. And this is one that shocked me. According to Gallup organization, who's another research 
Dormy says, those who attend weekly services give an average of 2.5% of their income, whereas non-religious people give up to 1.4%. So we do slightly better than the world. You see, Paul comes and he talks about this idea of reconciliation and he really begins to say, how, how serious are you about this? Are you really and genuinely willing to deal on a heart level? Because the Bible says where your treasure is, is where your heart is. Is where your heart is. And so he comes in and he begins to, to talk about this and he says and he wants to challenge our theories on this. I was reading this funny um, but kind of convicting um, thing just talk about our generous and how we are generous in theory. And it says, a missionary once asked a new convert, Pablo, if you had 100 sheep, would you give 50 of them to the Lord's work? He answered, you know I would gladly give them. And he says, if you had 50 cows, would you give them 25 to the Lord's work? Yes, you know I would be more than happy to do that. Again, the missionary, missionary asked him, if you had two pigs, would you give one of them to the Lord's work? Pablo said, that's not fair. You know I have two pigs. <laughs> see, see, many people are extremely generous in theory. But when it comes down to practice, that's when we like, we have that tension. So we live in this world that if I only had a million dollars, if I had this, if I had that, the question is not, God is not asking you that what would you do if you had a million dollars. He's asking you what would you do with the 10 that's in your pocket? And are you using it ultimately for his glory and for his work? Right? And one of the things that we got to recognize and we got to understand, again, according to Barner Research, he says this, the more money a person makes, the less likely he or she is to give. Now, we're talking about the stats, facts. The more money you make, the, more less, the less likely you are to give. We make excuses. And we can do it, we can talk about the church doesn't need it, we can talk about all the different things of what we, you know, the arguments, how much should we give, should we give 10% or we're like, we talk about all these things, well, I give my time and my talent, but I don't need to give my treasure, you know, I got bills to pay, I got to get out of debt, right, the church is going to mismanage it, whatever it is, we have a lot of different things, God understands my situation, right, but oftentimes, what ends up coming is that we really don't have models and examples. What, what, why I was so blown away by the Brazilian hospitality is because they put their money where their mouth was. It wasn't something in theory. They didn't ever have to say to me, we're just hospitable like that. I felt it. I sensed it. I experienced it. And these models and examples are things that have now compelled us to be a lot more hospitable, to be a lot more hospitable. And this is what Paul gets at in here. Sec again, 2 Corinthians, he goes, and just kind of, we're just going to read through these examples. I don't think these, these examples are meant to dissect and to try to go a word by word. I think these examples are meant to be looked at and to be seen as a holistic understanding of people who did not use um, an excuse to not be generous. Of people that if we were with them, we'd probably say, yeah, you're exempt from that. What's also interesting about this, this appeal, is that he says, I want to give you what was going on in Macedonia, that it is a well-known fact that Macedonia and the Corinthians were like rivals with one another, right, in the political realm. But now, basically, Paul uses this rivalry in the political realm and brings it into kind of a spiritual. He says, hey, let me show you what the Macedonians are doing. All right, and so he goes on and just kind of reading it briefly, he says, we want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that was given to the churches of Macedonia. What is the grace of God, this act of giving? He says this, verse 2, during a severe trial brought about by affliction, 
Their abundant joy and their extreme poverty overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. I can testify that according to their own ability and even beyond their ability of their own accord, they begged us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in the ministry of the saints. And not just as we had hope, instead they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us by God's will. So we urge Titus and Titus, that just as he had begun, so he should also complete among you this act of grace. Paul is saying, listen, the Macedonian experience encouraged me so much that we wanted to revisit this thing, this commitment that you, that you made. And what I love about the Macedonian example, he talks about this idea that grace is given. And we talked about a couple of me, uh, time, uh, weeks ago that grace is not just unmerited favor, but it's also divine enablement. And so it's according to God's divine enablement, they were able, even though they were in severe trials that, were brought about affliction, brought, that brought about affliction, that idea of severe trial or affliction, it means being crushed by life. Even though they, have been, they were being crushed by life, they had abundant joy. You see, this enablement gave the grace, gave them this idea of having the ability to have shots for the long haul. Not only did he talk about that, he talked about the extreme gen generosity. The extreme generosity. He says, even though they were extremely poor, they overflowed with wealth of generosity. And you're meant to see the contrast of those who are the most or the least likely to give were the ones who were overflowing. And the ones who were expecting to give, because Corinth was known as a very wealthy city, they were the ones who were making excuses of why not to give. And he was just like, that, that doesn't make any sense. And there's just excuses. But he, but he goes on and he says that generosity that we have comes for the purpose. He said they saw it as a privilege to partner, to share. That word that they use there is the Greek word that the same Greek word that we use for fellowship, kononia. That they saw this as a true opportunity to have true fellowship, kononia, partnership with one another. That it wasn't just a thing, when they suffer, we suffer. When they're happy, we're happy. They wanted to say that we wanted to share in that, and they saw this as, a, as an act of God's grace. And you see, and then that generosity that they had, and this is where I feel like Paul is driving at, it fueled reconciliation. It fueled reconciliation. Again, if you look at verses 6 and verse 7 of chapter 8, he says this, he says, so we urge, I'm sorry, verse 5. He says, not, let's, this context will go back to 4. They begged us earnestly for the privilege of sharing, for having cornonia in the ministry of the saints. And not just as we had hope, instead, there's that word, there's that, that, that idea. They what? They gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us by God's will. They saw the giving of our resources as a way that we can truly have partnership, not just with the Lord, but with one another. And it's when you combine your resources, there's something that happens, right? It's sort of the same thing that like when Angie and I, we do premarital counseling, that when we see these couples, they combine their resources. That's kind of the logical expectation that takes place. And it's, it's, a, it's a demonstration of oneness that they have in coming together. And so Paul is basically saying this, is that when we come together in partnership or in kononia with the Lord, and also with what the Lord has placed on our hearts, there's a genuine partnership. There's a genuine, on the heart level, reconciliation that's taking place. You see, because we can just say, hey, you know, I'm going to let you do you and I'm going to do me. You keep on doing your work and I'll keep on doing my work. Does anybody praise the Lord for what took place with, ba with Barnabas and Paul when they split? When they, started, they had controversy. The Lord's work, they both individually did their, the Lord's work together. Are we meant to celebrate that time? No. Because it's not just about doing the Lord's work. 
There was something that grieves us, but that, that, that wouldn't happen when later on in 2 Timothy, when Paul says, and call back Mark because he's refreshed me. That there's something about that unity. We don't know exactly all that went together, but that reconciliation, that it wasn't just that the Lord's work was happening, but it's the Lord's work was happening together. That there was a combination. And Paul says, if it's just about you doing your money with whatever you want to do with your money, and me doing my thing and my, with whatever what I want to do with my thing, he says, that's what, it's not true reconciliation. But when we come together, there's something that brings about this true generosity, this true cornonia, this true fellowship. And he brings out this example as, as for the Macedonians to show that this is something to be celebrated. But then he doesn't stop there. He moves and he recognizes and he says basically giving is done as a response to the gospel, this, as an act of grace. And that's kind of how he, he ends that section. He says, trust, I mean, he says, Titus, that just as he had begun, so he should also complete among you this act of grace. Five times in nine verses, if you just read grace, 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 grace. Ten times in these two chapters, grace, grace, grace. Generosity is motivated by grace, not by law. Paul comes in and he, he drills in this point. And he goes and he gives us now the example of Christ. See, Paul could, as an apostle, could have said, man, I'm demanding this from you. And he had this every divine right to do so. Actually, in 1 Corinthians, he says, I directed, as I direct all the churches. So he could give this as a response or a command, but he says, he says the opposite in verse, in verse 8 and 9. He says in verse 8, I am not saying this as a command, rather by means of diligence of others. I am testing the genuineness of your love. He says, I'm not using, I, I could come to you and say, you have to do this. But I'm not doing it on that basis. He said, because Paul recognizes grace is always a better motivator than the law. You see, the law will get you, well, it's a checkbox. Did I spend time with the Lord today? Check. I got my 15 minutes. I read my daily devotional. Did I give my tie? Check. Yep, I did my thing. Right? And that's how we, a lot of times, we treat because we don't think it's about relationships. We think it's about religion. We think God is happy with us. Like, oh, man, make sure that you go Get all your checks this week because that's what's most important to me. That's not what it's about. Grace is always a better motivator than law. Law gets us to do the bare minimum. Law brings up pride that now, because I've checked all my boxes, I'm more spiritually mature than you because you didn't check all your boxes. I give. I served in the mission of community team. I served in hospitality. I did my thing. You don't have all your checks, so you need to be like me, so let me help you be more like me, and let me teach you how to be like me, right? But that's, that's Christianity. That's where we do it. We go to the people who don't struggle with the things that we struggle with so that they, we can make them like them instead of us depending more on the grace and the personal work of Christ and recognizing that we're always going to be dependent. And so this is why Jesus, he's just like, listen, let me just kind of break this down for you. And Paul goes into an example in verse 9. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, this is about grace. I want you to be motivated by grace, be compelled by grace. This is about grace. The Lord of, our, of the Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. He says, let me give you an understanding of the gospel when it comes to being a generous steward. Generous steward is about, it's an act of grace. It's rightly understanding the gospel. Here we have God who did not stay in the heavens to try to fix a problem. But instead, God became a man, and the Bible says he tabernacled or he lived among us, i.e. becoming poor, so that we who were lacking up here trying to climb up to God with our towers of Babel, trying to make our ways up to God, says you're never going to build a tower big enough, high enough to get to God because your works are like filthy rags, so let me do this, let me become poor so that you can become rich. And so at the very core of the gospel is saying that I have expended all of my resources to get this thing right. 
I will never have a genuine relationship with God apart from the person and work of Christ. And so he becomes human, lives the life that we could not live, dies the death that we were supposed to die so that we can be reconciled to God. All of this was about reconciliation. God did not die so that you can be rich materially. God did not die so you could be just happy on this earth. God died so that you can be reconciled to him. This thing is all about reconciliation. And this is not something that's just the New Testament. This is the Old Testament. All of the plagues, all of the Ten Commandments, um, all of the, the, the things that happened in the Old Testament, if you just summarize it in Exodus chapter 19 and 4, he says, you saw what I did to the Egyptians and how I did all of the things. I did all of that so that you would return to me. Even when we see Malachi, Malachi says this idea of bring back all of your stuff into the storehouse, and we, we hear that we, we've lost it. The reason why he says bring all of that back, he says, because, listen, return to me, and I will return to you. It is your resource, it's your time, your talent, and your treasures that is keeping you from having genuine relationship with people and with God. That's the issue. And Paul says, let's get to the issue. Let's get very practical. And when you're stingy with your money, there's something that you're not believing about grace. So we got to address it. It's a gospel issue. And so as he's going, he's, he, he, he iterates that. He gives us the example of the Macedonians who did not lose, use an excuse. He then comes and gives us the ultimate example of the person and work of Jesus. So even though he was completely rich, he became poor. That the, in Philippians, he goes on to say that even though he was in the form of God, he did not think equality with God was something to be grasped. But instead, he emptied himself to the form of a bondservant, even to the point of death, death on the cross. He became the worst type of person to reach the worst type of people so that no one can feel excluded, that this is not based upon your works, but it's based upon the finished work of him. And so everything, every reality of life should come out of that understanding. And so therefore, to be Christian is to be generous. Why? Because we serve a generous God, and if we have our identity and we look anything like our father, we should carry some of the characteristics and the attributes of the father. And this is why they call it fruit of the Spirit. Because the Spirit naturally produces certain fruit. And so it is critical for us to understand this. And so Paul gives us the person and work of Jesus. And he talks about this. And again, he talks about this act of grace. This act of grace. And so in then he, verse 10, he says, and and, and in this matter, I am giving you advice because it is profitable for you. It's, he's not saying this is not profitable about helping them. Because, you know, we feel like, well, you know, oh, I feel good. We gave to the poor. We did our things. No, he said this is profitable for you. Because money has a grip on you. Your possessions have a grip on you. They say the average person spends over 50% of their life thinking about money and possessions. That we spend all of this time about obtaining things on this life. And we're missing it. He says the only way you can be freed from that is by being generous with them. This is for you. This is not primarily for them. God has a million different ways that he can address the marginalized, the poor, the disenfranchised. He don't need you for that. He wants you to be generous so you can trust him because this is about a trust issue. And this is why in Matthew chapter 6 where he says, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. He says, don't I clothe the lilies, don't I do all, don't I do all of that. He says, but you first seek the kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all those things that you spend all your life trying to get, those things will be added to you. God is like, what's keeping you is your generosity or lack thereof. 
And if you really want to be gospel fluent, have a gospel identity, you got to overcome this American idol. You got to overcome the idolatry of it. Very similar to the church of Corinth. And so that's why he says, I am testing the genuineness of your love. I am testing it. And so he ends this letter or ends this section, but he says, listen, let me just kind of give you clearly what I'm saying. Verse 11, now, also finish the task. It's not the thought that counts. So that just as there was an eager desire, there may also be a completion of that desire according to what you have. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable to what a person has, not according to what a person doesn't have. Some of you guys are using the excuse, well, hey, what I'm going to give is not going to help really anybody. God is like, listen, you keep on thinking that it's about them. This is about you. Stop talking about what you don't have. Give what you do have. Trust me. He says according to what he does, it's not according to what he does not have, but what he has. It is not that there should be relief for others and hardship for you, but it is a question of equality. And at the present time, your surplus, surplus is available for their need so that their abundance may in turn meet your need in order that there may be equality. Verse 15, as it is written, the person who had much did not have too much and the person who had little did not have too little. And so Paul basically comes and he just says, listen, we have to understand and we have to under, uh, recognize what it means to be a generous steward. And he gives these final two exhortations and we'll, we'll be dismissed. Number one is this, follow through on your commitment. Eagerness is not enough. Verse 11 and 12, follow through on your commitment. Eagerness is not enough. We talked about that already. And number two, be generous with what you have and put your confidence in Christ not your possessions. Put your confidence in Christ and not your possessions. If you read this passage, his, the, his exhortation for generosity had nothing to do with the welfare of the people in Jerusalem. That was his normal practice. But his exhortation had all to do with them. How do I know that? Because of verse 15. Verse 15, it says, he says this, as he gives a quote, basically, as it is written, the person who had much did not have too much, and the person who had little did not have too little. You know where that verse comes from? It was during the time when the Lord, in, their, in the 40 years of wandering, when God was providing manna for them every day. And during that time of him providing manna, basically in Exodus, he, he, they went out, and a couple of people was like, man, I'm, I'm going to think smarter than everybody else. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take, when the manna comes out, I'm going to get two days worth of ration. I'm going to store it up so that the next day we'll have it all stored up. God was like, no, 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 no. That's not the way this thing was set up. And then we know that that manna ended up becoming worms. See, the thought is the ones who are wealthy, who have bank accounts, who has wealth and who has all the stuff, they're the most secure. And the problem is, is that there is a misguided trust. So the goal is, as soon as I get financially stable, then I'll be stable. Because we think stability comes with how much is in our bank account or how many assets we have. And he says, he quotes this for the sake of the Corinthians. He says, listen, those who have, you don't have too much. Those who don't have, you don't have too little. Basically, that verse is saying, trust in my daily provision. Whether I give you much or little, you be faithful over what I give you. And that's what it means to be generous. And these are the examples that we see both in the Macedonians and in the person and work of Christ of what it means to be generous. And in the next couple of weeks, 
we'll, we'll begin to unpack in chapter 9 just how that there is a certain desire and there is a way that we ought to go about doing that. But he said we first got to get this. Where is your confidence? Where does your trust lie? Are you all in when it comes to this thing called reconciliation? Are you willing to invest it all? Are you holding back something? You see, it's hard to be reconciled and mature without being a generous steward of God's resources. So my prayer for us as we go to war, as we stay in war, we stay right in the battle, that we begin to release, Lord, what am I holding back? Right? This message is about money, and for most of us, it's going to be about money. But for some of us, there's some other things that we're holding back. We're holding back, we're keeping in, we're not fully giving over to the Lord. And it's killing us as the body of Christ. It's killing our ability to truly be reconciled. And so we need to do business before the Lord.